Good afternoon to you and welcome to our webinar today, Improving Project Handover. Uh, we're not going to start immediately, uh, we've got a couple of minutes and what we're looking to do really is to get you logged into Mentimeter or menti.com. So you can see uh, at the top there, you need to enter menti.com in your browser and use the code 579805. We know some of you have already done that, you're starting to like the prospect of this webinar with Owen. Um, we will go through various slides in just a moment, but really I want to uh, talk to you briefly about the current consultation on the APM body of knowledge. So we're currently at six and we're moving to uh, block seven, uh, and there's a consultation round that closes on Friday the 20th of April, so you've got just after a week to do that. Um, you'll find details of how to do that in the APM website, and there's a short link to take you to that uh, consultation page. So we do want you to do that. Uh, you can do that either as individuals or the benefits SIG who are bringing this uh, webinar to you today. We're going to do it as a, as a team effort. So, but do please contribute to that uh, and be part of the next um, BOC. So we'll just flick back to the title of the webinar, um, Improving Project Handover. Um, that's by Owen. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, give a few, uh, use a few slides to find out about you, and then after that we're going to flick over for the presentation, and then we're going to come back to actually complete a survey that was previously used by Owen in his research. So that's going to be what we're doing. I make it 12:30 now, and it looks like we've got something like 250 attendees on the line, which is which is fantastic. So I'll keep informed of numbers. So uh, once again, the uh, BOC. Um, then uh, please do contribute to that if you're able. So our first question, what we want to know is, are you a member of the APM? And if so, at what level? So we'll, we'll have a look and see who we've got on the call. Uh, we've used this question before, so have some sort of idea as to how this is gonna, gonna pan out. Uh, and you see the numbers voting on the right-hand side. So many of you have logged in. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you for that, and um, we'll see what's what. We can see um, that we have a good number of associates and members, but far less of us as fellows or, or students. But um, we'll, um, you'll be able to complete that later on. Now we get to know what type of project-related job role do you typically perform? And these categories are, are taken from the Project Delivery Capability Framework, We've got project leaders, um, those in senior management, delivery specialists, or where we sit as benefits managers in the business analysis and change specialist function. So we want to know a little bit about you in terms of um, where you operate, and indeed if you, if you don't work in project-related uh, areas, then that's great. So um, please fill that in, and that will be useful to Owen a little later, um, and then we'll move on to the uh, final question in this um, early part. What term best describes the main focus of the organization in which you work? So typically the, the sector, um, and we'll watch these word cloud appears. And I guess many of you know the, um, the larger the term, then um, the more people working in that area. And of course that's gonna be useful to Owen as he again pitches uh, what he's got. So. Um, I mean, I'm sure you can see the screen, but leaders coming through in terms of construction and education. So thank you very much for that. What we'll now do then is um, flick on to the introduction of Owen. And in order to do that, I'm going to change presenter so that Owen is ready to go straight into his presentation. But I'm gonna introduce my colleague, Rebecca, from the Benefits Management SIG, who would in turn will uh, introduce Owen. So. Um, Oh, and I think we can see your screen. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you, Merv. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this APM Benefits Management SIG webinar on how we can improve handover of projects. My name is Rebecca Casey. I'm a lecturer here at Newcastle University Business School, but I'm also a member of the APM Benefits Management SIG. Um, so briefly, just some how quick housekeeping to cover. Um, this webinar is being rec recorded and the slides will be available on YouTube and SlideShare uh, via the Benefits Management SIG community page. 
Um, you will also receive um, the usual feedback survey from the APM after the webinar. Um, it should uh, reach you within two to three hours. Um, and can I please ask for your participation? So if you can write any questions you have for Owen in the question box, um, and we will have a Q&A session after uh, Owen has given his presentation. If we can't answer all of those questions today, we will follow them up directly after the webinar, and uh, the, the answers to those questions will be posted to our community webpage. So personally, I have a real interest in this topic uh, since uh, a successful handover is so critical to, to realizing benefits. I had the pleasure of hearing this pet presentation face-to-face -face at the Yorkshire and North Lincolnshire branch event earlier this year. This is a very under-researched topic and Owen's study provides us with a useful and insightful contribution to both knowledge and practice. Owen is an experienced project and program manager with a background in both the public and private sectors with a specialism in education including academies and the BSF program and health and he's also a member of the Soft Landings User Group. So I have great pleasure in, in introducing to Owen. Thank you, Owen. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, just to pick up on, uh, on where I started there, so improving project handover, or to phrase it another way, how can we hand projects over better? And this was a piece of research, as Rebecca said, that I did with, uh, with APM. The purpose of it is to try and to get a position where we're um, giving practical advice some hints and tips for practitioners as to how we can kind of alter the focus, change ways of working, learn from good practice in others um, so that we can improve handling projects from the project phase into the business as usual phase. Um, so I thought what I'd start with is looking at the McLaren 650 sports car. Um, this could be REBA building stages, it could be any kind of process which is looking at how we move from design into operation. But McLaren had a fantastic website which enabled me to pinch a lot of these slides, so that was very, very useful. Um, for those that are interested, top speed of 207 miles an hour, naught to 60 in three seconds, and the small sum of 200,000 pounds will buy you a McLaren 650 sports car. McLaren say that they're inspired by nature, whether it's a bull nose of a whale shark, the sharp edges of tail fins, or swept back wings of birds of prey when diving, there are so many hints and tips in the animal kingdom. So this gives you an idea of the kind of aspirations of what they're looking for. So they start at the very, very beginning with a stated aim. They've got a strategy. The aim of the McLaren, for example, was to create the most exciting, most technologically advanced, and most dynamically accomplished supercar ever made. So they've got real aspirations stated from the outset. They then start breaking it down into a little bit more detail and designing it in a bit more detail. So the aerodynamics of it, with every car they're looking to capture and visualize their philosophy and to show the way air flows around the cars. So they've got the aim established. The engineering and design team start considering in, in meticulous detail how they can then achieve their objective. So the structure, the layout, and the packaging are designed before they even start putting pen to paper. Um, the aerodynamic proportions of the model is tested. They've got a state-of-the-art wind tunnel to ensure that they're able to meet all the, all the key targets that they set at the very beginning. Um, and then they start moving into sketching the sort of uh, the initial designs. Um, so they're, they're talking about pen and pad and creative flow and their designers spend most of their time sketching. So they start with early concept, and then they work with other teams progressing the drawings um, so that each element of the car is designed by hand. From there, they move into clay modeling. Clay is one of the most effective tools for evaluating a car's design, apparently. You can see the contours, you can feel the shapes, you can feel the textures of it, um, and it also then enables them to uh, add and remove so that they can test different shapes, different contours, aerodynamics, that type of thing. So the design is uh, progressing and developing as they go along. Oops, excuse me. They then start looking at the innovative technology element of it. So they're sitting there and from there, they're talking about a proactive chassis control system. And for those of you that know a lot more about cars than I, that will be apparent. Um, they've got an ex exotic 
In Connell exhausts, every concept and component is meticulously engineered to produce the most exhilarating supercars in their class. Proactive chassis control, carbon fiber monocell, splitter, diffuser, air brakes, side vents, and other words that sound exciting and innovative. Um, the point being that as these iterate and the design process works its way through, they're incrementally improving all the way along. We then start going into the production center. So McLaren Technology is based in Woking. It's a Norman Foster design building. Um, their production staff wear Hugo Boss uniforms, and the company cafeteria serves food from their own catering firm. Um, they're, they're talking of a fusion of precise production techniques and hand craftsmanship, a bespoke assembly pr process, which they spent a lot of time um, refining, developing. The attention to detail that they talk about is, is minute. They get drilled into every, um, every aspect of it. Um, looking through to the high performance process. So it takes 4,000 hours to make each carbon fiber chassis for the McLaren F1. And then 20 years later, it takes them four hours to produce it for the uh, McLaren 650. So it's taking things all the way through that process again. Accuracy is to within thousands of a millimeter. Post-production, every car goes onto a road simulator and a thing called a monsoon, which is a bespoke water chamber. So they release a uh, thousand liters of water over, uh, over the car and they use that to test the aerodynamics, the robustness of the car. You could argue, and you know, there is probably um, some minute incremental gains that could be put in there, but you could argue that they did everything right. The level of detail on that design, the expense, the techniques, the processes, everything has been refined to the, the, the nth degree. And then they give it to the end user who crashes it into a tree. Now, you could argue, does that really matter? And it was interesting, Rebecca made the point that I've done this presentation um, in, uh, in York, and there was a person there who um, represented, or knew someone who represented, the um, Land Rover. Um, production cycle and their view is that the production element of it the client is effectively the design team rather than the end user so you could look at this and say well what is a project the APM definition of a project is a unique transient endeavor undertaken to achieve planned objectives which could be defined in terms of outputs outcomes or benefits so if your planned objective is you've got your supercar if the outputs is you've got your supercar the question is, if it's not delivering the benefits to the end user, is it a failed project or not? My view is that a project should be a delivery device for benefits. And by looking at that, the handover becomes the start and not the end, or at least in the time cycle of benefit delivery, it's very much front end. Because the risk is, if you don't put benefits and the why of doing the project up front, you can end up with a white elephant. <coughs> Excuse me. So the projects which deliver a technical solution but don't work as they intended, or those that deliver a working solution that nobody particularly wants, or those that deliver a working solution that delivers no added benefits. So the risk is that we carry on delivering projects that don't really work for anybody. Just to provide that in a bit of global context, um, at September 20, 2015, talking about 143 major projects representing 405 billion pounds of investment over the next 25 years to improve the UK's infrastructure um, and transform public services and safeguard national security. APM has approximately 22,500 individual, 590 corporate members. It's the largest professional body of its kind in Europe. Just looking at LinkedIn, there's 2 point some million project managers there's a lot of projects being delivered, and there's a significant risk that if we're not delivering them in the way that we should be, or we're not transitioning them from project phase into use, that becomes wasted investment or wasted effort. Worldwide, infrastructure spending will grow from four trillion per year in 2012 to more than nine trillion per year by 2025. So overall, we've got close to 78 trillion expected to be spent globally between 2014 and 2025. 
Now, obviously, those figures may shift and move a little bit, but the extent of the investment is apparent. And to just give a bit of a visual, that someone stood by a trillion dollars. When you start multiplying that up by 78, that is someone stood by 78 trillion dollars. It's an awful lot of money. We have a responsibility to get it right. Infrastructure projects alone equate to 12% of global GDP. So the moral, economic, and professional responsibility to get this level of spending right if we're to maintain credibility. So standing back and looking at what makes a good handover, the client gets what they pay for, what they are expecting, and it does what you all agreed it would do, and they know what to do with it once they get it. In terms of a good handover from the project manager's perspective, you as a project manager have done your job well. It's your reputation, it's your market value, if you like. Um, there's the personal and professional satisfaction of doing a scheme very well. You walk away feeling good, you leave happy clients, you get more work. And I think there's a little bit of, I sort of fairly facetiously put, you sold a good car there. Um, there is, it's a service industry. And if we're delivering for our clients, then we're giving them projects that do what they want them to do. And a lot of that is how you hand that over and transition it. Because I think after two months, a project manager is rarely judged on how well they manage the project. Frankly, even the cost, time, quality things start dropping off a little bit the further the project goes from handover. But we're judged on whether the benefits of the project that the project was initially funded have been delivered. As a practitioner, I think, are you prepared to leave your professional reputation in the hands of people that you haven't properly briefed? Because everyone will talk about that project as your project afterwards. I think that the guy who crashed his supercar said, uh, well, I doubt he said that it was his fault. Um, he probably went and told his friends at the golf club that they're incredibly unresponsive and hard to drive and they should never buy one. So just to stand back and give you a bit of an overview of myself and the schemes that I've worked on. Um, I've worked for Sheffield City Council for um, on schemes with Kia uh, for Sheffield Local Education Partnership. I'm a member of Bisria's Soft Landings User Group, um, project managed on construction schemes, on IT schemes. I've worked for consultancy in Mott McDonald. I've also worked for myself and I'm currently working at Sheffield Hallam University. So the experience of what I'm trying to bring from here is working on varied schemes in different industries and um, there's, there's a reasonable amount of commonality in some of these factors. So in terms of the approach for my research, I started off with a literature study. There isn't a vast amount of literature that's been written around project handover. As Rebecca mentioned, it's a reasonably under-researched area. There's some stuff that came out of the construction industry, things like the Egan report and the Latham report where they were looking at um, how to how to get the best out of the investment and how to make sure that the schemes that get delivered move into operational phases in ways that uh, that are most beneficial. Um, but uh, there isn't a lot of literature on this on this topic. Um, I also did some formal interviews with people, and I've got a list in a moment. I'll show you. I'll share as to who it is that I've been uh, interviewing. I've had a, uh, a survey monkey that APM sent round, um, and I'll talk to you in a little bit more detail about that in a few minutes. Um, and I also had a few kind of informal, off-the-record chats with uh, with some people that I've either worked with or uh, or friends of friends, because sometimes you need to uh, you need to get some information that uh, is, uh, is is a little bit more informal as to how you can structure things. So in terms of interviewing, um, I interviewed uh, the Mersey Gateway scheme. I talked to the Education Funding Agency, Lang O'Rourke, um, that's Media City, um, the move for the BBC to Salford, uh, TFL, Crossrail, Vinci Construction, the Soft Landings User Group, um, and uh, Mott McDonald. And in terms of outputs of this, um, the sort of model was the APM's 12 project success factors because it was a, um, a sort of a practitioner focused area of, uh, of a crib sheet, if you like, that you could use on projects. Um, there's also um, some magazine 
uh, has gone into the project and other publications and also um, some speaking talks that I've done with it. I think one of the key things that came out of the research was looking at what is handover and having so going on APM's definition, the point in the life cycle where deliverables are handed over to the sponsor and users. To look at Prince 2's definition, the project should have a clear end with a correct handover of information and responsibility. In practice, when you stand back and look at your scheme, and if we take a building scheme for instance, it could be practical completion. It could be the end of the defects and liability period or when the on-site support from the project team leaves site. It could be when there's no more snags. It could be once the last of the three post-occupancy evaluations has been completed. When there's no members of the project team involved on the scheme, when you hit financial close, or when the benefits established at the outset have been delivered. Um, now, that could be a significant period of time if, for instance, the school could be around educational attainment or results. It'd be hard to tie those in, but the point being it's really important to have an agreed position on this between all parties, otherwise you're all aiming for a completely different target effectively. This was a scheme that I'd worked on, the Trent Cardiac Centre in Nottingham, and again, how you would define handover at that point, it could be the go live of the building, the first operation, the first procedure, the first full patient pathway experience, first day is open, practical completion, when a facilities management take full control when the project manager is reassigned, the end of the snag list, or when the benefits are delivered. The sort of underlying position with that is that it's not a date, it's a process. It's a process of transition from one team to another. It's a transition of ownership, management, responsibility, knowledge, continuity, benefits realization, and operational responsibility and it requires changes in culture in operations in processes and the perception of ownership um, it, it can't just be a set in stone there's the keys the going back to the original point of the project being an enabler for the benefits the changes required from the people who are receiving the output of the project need to be put in place and transitioned at the same time that the project outputs are. Otherwise, someone gets thrown a ball that they're not in a position to catch. So I've mentioned earlier around the survey that went out. So in terms of the survey respondents, we have a mix of client, contractor, and third party. So what we've used, and we come back at the end of the presentation on this, um, because we're going to ask you to put some sort of responses forward on some of these questions as well, if, uh, if you'd be so kind to give some of your time. So it was a Likert scale for strongly agreed to strongly disagree based on your experience of a good project or projects. So looking at what we got on that, the top two consensus positions, so 85% of the people that responded agreed with these statements. So the benefits of the project are established by the client at the outset and are communicated to the project delivery team and crucially in a format that is clear and measurable. So they're smart benefits as best you can, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and time bound. Um, what are the drivers and are they arranged in any kind of priority order? So it could be financial, you could be talking about a revenue increase headcount, cost redu reduction, number of paying clients. It could be non-financial, so it could be client retention, customer satisfaction, agility, improved controls, compliance, audit scores. And I think that it's about um, having clear, defined benefits from very, very early on. It's the why of the project, basically. Um, the other one on here that everyone strongly agreed with was the likelihood of good performance in one project can lead to subsequent work for the same project in the short to medium term. So it's basically saying, can you incentivize success? Um, if you've done a good job on this one, can I give you more work, basically? And I know sometimes, quite a lot of the work that I've done has been in public sector, that can be problematic from a procurement perspective because someone could do a really, really good job, 
but you can't necessarily just go to them directly again. Um, but then I think perhaps you'd look at forms of contracting that you start saying, well, what are our other ways of being able to incentivize success? The other significant agreed um, question areas, the end users, so those who will be using the project outputs once handed over, are represented on the project team throughout the project life cycle. Um, it's, it's talking about avoiding that sort of silo working and the serve and volley of chucking something over the fence and running away, having people moving through then at different project stages, which leads into the next one around knowledge, experience, and lessons learned from previous projects being available and actively reviewed before the commencement of a project or project stage. So do we learn from our mistakes? Organizations that are systemized sufficiently to capture and share the lessons learned, it might be a more mature organization, um, and it might be an organization that is able to avoid some of the pitfalls and traps that, uh, that previous schemes have fallen foul of. Uh, I think I, I wouldn't be the only one um, if I was to say in my experience, sometimes we make the same mistakes over and over again. And the more systemized we can get at capturing those lessons, and also capturing those lessons as we go along, rather than waiting till the end when you have a wrap-up session and either some of the most important people or some of the people with the good information in their heads have left, um, or you get the stuff that people remembered most recently rather than the stuff that has happened all the way along. So if there's a way of capturing as you go along at key defined stages, you get a much richer data set. Moving down in terms of the scale of agreement, so a member of the project team remains on site and available post handover for longer than a two week period and financial decisions are made in the context of total cost of ownership and operation over the life cycle rather than just the capital value of the project itself. So in terms of the first one, retaining the skills and knowledge, uh, it's a, a colleague I used to work with had the phrase, he knows where the bodies are buried. You can shortcut a lot of that transition period if you're able to retain the knowledge. And I know in many schemes, if a project has been successful, people will be poached to move on to other things. The more you can retain that transfer, the better. Um, in terms of the um, financial element of it, this is another one that can be quite tricky in many organizations because the capital and the revenue are often separate pots. So basically, whoever is building or creating the project phase might not necessarily be the same people that are the people that are operating it. So if the decision to be made is, do we spend a bit up front to improve a bit going forward or to support investment going forward, then you have to have a holistic overview of the whole life cost of the scheme. Um, and that's where perhaps you can start engaging with project sponsors to see whether a decision can be made corporately or strategically rather than just focused on project budgets there might be a very good reason to overspend the project budget for a long-term cost. This was one that the Leichhardt scale and the phrasing of the question, um, I think in many ways kind of, I, I caught a cold with the way that it was put together. The end user training is delivered in a concentrated period just before handover. Well, a lot of people said, yes, that's the way it is. But in the sort of free text element of it, the, uh, the, the, it was questioned as to whether that should be the case. So it often is, but phasing would be better was one of the comments I got. Um, I also got the comment, the project team's behavior is to focus on completion of the project and view end user training as part of project completion. I think this is about how I phrased the question rather than the responses, because I think in discussions with folks about it, a lot of what I was getting is that the training is too concentrated in a very short period of time so as the project uh, nears completion and they start getting to the transition, you have a period where a lot of information is tried to be downloaded to certain individual or individuals in very kind of overwhelming short spaces of concentrated time. And that might not be the best way to, uh, to impart that information and get the person upskilled into moving on forward with managing it. These are interesting outputs of the, um, a lot of people kind of either commented or disagreed or felt that these were low priority items or they haven't seen these 
in successful projects. So the format and method of transferring project data is tailored to each project and client individually. So the comments we got on that were it depends on the client. Outcomes could be patchy as a level of as a result of client level of requirements. Um, and I think quite frequently and currently I'm sat on client side. And I think it's a fair comment to say that the client is often not clear in asking for the information and the format in which the information is handed across in. So what you get is, moving on to the other comment, the subcontractor produces documentation in a standard format for each project delivery. So basically, if as a client you don't specify the information that you want and the format in which you want it, you get what you're given. Um, then the, the next one is planning for the transition of project data and knowledge from the project teams to end users runs from the start of the project throughout the project's life cycle. And the comment I got on that, which is quite telling, project teams only ever focus on completing the project and moving on to their next project. So that is not taking a benefits-based approach on it. That's basically saying, right, do it, drop, and run. And I think that that is quite telling. So the four emergent areas that, uh, that were coming out of the research were around grouped into commercial contractual, contractual process, data knowledge transfer, and people. So to pick up the commercial and the contractual, would highly recommend that any requirements are written into tender documentation or contracts in as much detail and specificity as possible because the more accurate the specification, the more likely the output to fulfill the needs of the commissioners. So as a client, if you write down what you want, you stand a much better um, chance of getting what you've written down, or at least you have it there in black and white, um, rather than trying to figure it out as you go along. It does fall into the don't ask, don't get. And sometimes being made to make decisions around what is required early on puts the onus on the client to come up with those answers sooner so it focuses thinking in a more targeted manner. Um, whole life costs must be considered if at all possible and incentivizing success. So the target costs, shared profit, repeat work, commercial endorsement, which can be valuable to the market, um, learning lessons, shared IPR, um, selling processes. There are different ways of trying to incentivize success that aren't necessarily always about, I have to have repeat work because I am aware that, particularly with uh, with public money, that can be a difficult uh, difficult scenario to try and write in. Um, looking at the process element of it, it's focusing on the fact that the handover is a process and not a date. So planning for it should be from the start of the project and it should be viewed as an incremental transfer of knowledge and operation from the project team to the business as usual environment. So it incorporates a series of mini handovers through the project phase. Some of the examples that I was, uh, I was provided with as part of the research were in the construction industry doing a sample room or dry runs, simulations, data readiness tests. So whoever is going to be operating whatever the project is delivered, before it hands over, go and check the data set that's currently been pulled together and see whether you can find the bit of information that you need in a way that is understandable and quick to get to. Because before everyone scatters to the four winds, you can start putting some steps in place to try and address that. Um, the benefits and deliverables must be measurable and communicable from the start. You can still have softer benefits, but it does fall into the what gets measured gets managed. So customer satisfaction or end user satisfaction can be measured um, it, it can be done in numerous different ways. So it doesn't have to be the, the, the sort of the, the logical obvious ones are around things like um, energy consumption or cost, but the softer benefits are measurable. And if they're intangible, then I would start questioning whether that is a strong enough driver for the scheme if they're all intangible. Um, involving the end users from the outset, you frequently find that processes start considering handover a couple of months out and say, right, let's get everyone in a room and start. If you can drip feed information as it goes through, the evidence that I've received as a result of this says that that is a far more effective way of transferring information in an ongoing phased way while you've got the skills in the room effectively. 
in terms of that data and knowledge transfer, having documentation written for the end users is critical. It's all very well just getting a massive data dump of information, but if it's in an unusable, unsearchable format, it ultimately just ends up getting put in a cupboard or whatever the cloud version of that is and not accessed. It's naming conventions, it's searchable PDFs. Um, the common data environment is a really important thing to start looking at. Um, what as clients, from a systems perspective, are the key um, key systems that you've got there, and what have you got from the um, project team, and can you put that data in that shared environment earlier on, rather than packaging it up and handing it across in one go. Um, collating lessons learned on the project as it progresses, it provides more meaningful data for future projects, but it can also be tied, as I said previously, to stage gateways or key deliverables. That then also gives you um, a decision log and a, a history of the project for when people move on um, and agree in the information requirements at the outset is, is really um, a, a critical piece of work. And it's it, importantly, it's, it's not doing things twice. It's a piece of work that will happen at some point, but if you do it too late, it's rushed or fumbled. Looking at the people element of it, and some of this is, uh, is, is, is simple but effective. So getting good people on your project and keeping them for as long as you're able sounds in some ways a bit of a facile statement, but it's one of the things that fighting for the project team you want and fighting to keep them for the duration and not releasing them early as commercial or other pressures start squeezing, basically. Um, that might not just be a pay issue as well. It's talking about incentivizing and motivating people. One of the people that I spoke to who will remain nameless, um, he reviewed how his people work and what their incentives were. And some of them were about childcare or working hours, but he knew who he wanted on his team and therefore he did everything he could to keep them on his team and saw that as a key managerial responsibility for him as a program manager. Um, the definition of stakeholders should be carried out throughout and in detail. There's a bit of an assumption and probably from, if I put my kind of project manager hat on, it's, it's a preference that you have single end user representation because you've got a single point of contact that you can go get decisions from. But the problem that you can get with that is that you have only one person who is making those decisions. And then when you finally get to a full suite of end users at the end, they go, well, I don't know who have decided that was a good idea. So it's making sure that you have appropriate stakeholders and map those stakeholders out based on the operation of the end project deliverable so that you can understand, you can bring people in for specific sessions and then drop them away again and bring them in. And so you can kind of, the, the soft landings approach to this is termed pit stopping. So you get folks in for a session, away they go again. So it doesn't have to be that you have a cast of thousands, but reviewing your stakeholders as you go along and targeting the information and the outputs based on what they're going to be doing at the end of the, uh, with the project once it's handed over is an important thing to consider from the beginning all the way through. Um, and the client role being pivotal. So it's not necessarily in a customer is always right way, although that is a bit of a factor. But in the transcripts of the interviews that I was doing, the word that was coming out over and over and over again was client. Who is the client? What are their drivers? Have you got terms of reference or briefing for sponsors and clients that can be held as well as the, contra as the contractor and project team inductions? Because oftentimes, having a strong client or a strong sponsor is, um, a, is held up as a failing of the uh, project phase until you get to the handover. And because the client hasn't been strong or consistent and the sponsorship hasn't been strong and consistent, no one is particularly satisfied with the end result. And I think looking at how you would define the client and, uh, and what that role would be is, uh, is, is quite important. I've, I've, I've put together some, um, I, I won't say necessarily all from my experience, but from some of the discussions that I was having around this, and this probably falls into the off the record discussions, different modes of client. This I would call the demanding client. The, uh, the positive for that is that they know what they want um, and you get very clear instruction and guidance from them. The negative of it is that they know what they want no matter what. 
So they're likely to not be the most receptive to partnership working or open-minded to new ideas. On the flip side of that, you have the sort of feed me client. And the sort of the, the, the downside of that is that they're very passive, difficult to get decisions from them. Um, it's, uh, it's a lack of, they're never satisfied. There's a, there's a massive risk of scope creep with a client like this. The advantage of it is that they're likely to be open to new ideas. And that can be used to test new processes or new ways of working. The, uh, all the gear, no idea. The sort of the, the in enthusiasm and the can-do attitude of a client who's really up for delivering this project, but they don't really know what they're doing. Um, the, 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 the enthusiasm and the can-do attitude is a positive thing. On the flip side of that, they think they know best when they often don't. And they have strong ideas often built on weak foundations. So they're unlikely to, uh, to admit mistakes. The reason for looking at this is because client is such a prominent factor in this, having an understanding of different client types, albeit in a fairly kind of facetious and simplistic manner here, it's important to understand from a transition and handover that the role of the client is absolutely critical. And I think putting yourself in the client position, whether you are or not, is a useful exercise for anyone working on schemes because looking at the client what are their drivers what does a good transition mean to them do they know what they need to do to be ready because this project is unlikely to be the full gamut of a client's role is probably a small part of a wider role and your priority might not necessarily be their emergency so the risk there's a risk of leaving decisions till too late or until the last minute and a, a, a lack of readiness to change. So they might need pushing to devote the time necessary to get ready, or they might need to be supported to enact the necessary changes to their ways of working to smooth that transition. When it works right, it looks like that. When it works badly, it looks like that. But it is a question to say, well, what if there'd been these two sessions put in as part of the purchase. They could have said, come along, see the car being made, have a photo, put in there, press all the buttons, have a test drive at the local track. It wouldn't have cost a significant amount of money from McLaren's perspective. It will be part of a PR thing and it would have stopped the person who's just driven that into a tree going around his golf club and telling people never to buy a McLaren because they go and handle right. So just in summary, three things to check this afternoon tomorrow, some key kind of um, elements that are coming out of that. What benefits are your project or projects enabling? What changes in practice are required by business as usual to deliver them? So is the person that's catching the ball ready to catch it when it's thrown? And how can the project team better prepare the end users in advance? And that's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks ever so much for that, Owen. That's been uh, really insightful and really good. I think people are now going to be ready for the um, the survey, and perhaps you could um, talk us through that. Let me just get across to share my screen. Um, and uh, one moment. There we are. So hopefully you can see my screen, and people will now be able to log into Mentimeter. You might need to refresh your browser. Um, in order to get to this slide and you can take this at audience pace so you can move ahead but uh, Owen is going to give us a bit more commentary and background as we do it. Um, we want you to think about projects that you've been involved in that have been deemed as successful and we're going to ask you to what extent you agree with the following nine statements that were the nine statements used um, during the course of the, uh, the research by Owen. So um, hopefully you're already on that, and let's have a look. Owen, I don't know if you can just kind of explain a little bit about them as we move through it. Yeah, by all means. So these these are referring back to the uh, the, the, the questions that I'd asked during the survey. Um, so it's it's saying on schemes that you've worked at, are the benefits of projects clearly established to all stakeholders at the beginning, and are they measurable? Um, and uh, I, I, it's, it's reasonably self-explanatory, I think, that. Okay, uh, we'll move on. But as I say, audience pace, so um, please uh, feel free to catch up. Uh, repeat work. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, is it, is it possible, um, and have you seen it done, to incentivize good, uh, good performance? Um, and do you believe that this is an important part of whether you get a good outcome, essentially? Okay, thank you for that one. Uh, end user representation. Mm -hmm. So are you bringing the end users in um, throughout the project lifecycle, or is it kind of a, not a last minute thought, but even if it's programmed in, is it put at the back end of the project? Um, if you're going down the strongly agree route, then what you're saying is, yes, we think that they should be brought in um, throughout the project lifecycle. Okay, lessons learned. Mm -hmm. um, on the schemes that you've worked on that have gone well, have you had lessons learned from similar schemes to be able to evaluate? Um, and do you agree that this is a, uh, a worthwhile thing to have? Okay, on-site support. Mm -hmm. So that's basically saying at the point of handover, there is a transition phase when you've got people who have worked on the project remaining on site for longer than two weeks. Okay, uh, you see the numbers there um, building out quite nicely. We've still got 350 people on the call, so uh, we expect a good number of votes. Uh, uh, whole life cost. Yes, um, basically, do you have the opportunity, have you seen it done well, and is it important to consider the whole life cost, so the capital and the revenue elements of this, the operating costs and the upfront costs? Okay. And training for handover, I know you uh, had quite a bit to say on that one. Yeah, I, again, this, this is one where I think what I would probably ask when people are answering this is, do you think it's correct that training happens in a concentrated period? Does that give you the best outcomes? Okay. Documentation. Yeah, so this is the common data environment and being specific um, so that the handover materials are bespoke to the client, or is it basically, this is how we deliver handover material, we always just get something off the shelf. It's that, that extra level of detail working with the client to make it bespoke. Okay, and knowledge transfer finally. Yes, I'd, I'd be very interested to see whether knowledge transfer is planned from the start of the project or not. So the, what you're agreeing with or disagreeing with is basically um, knowledge transfer plan from the start of the project improves handover or it doesn't. Okay, uh, and we've seen a significant number of responses. That's great. Uh, I think you told me, Owen, that on your original survey you said it had something like 25 responses. So um, this is giving us a much uh, wider sample and we, we know uh, we've got a lot of people from the project delivery space as well as uh, uh, the other ones, so uh, that's Absolutely, fantastic. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, and I, I know um, we're really after your um, free text responses. We will look through those and uh, share them back to you. What suggestions do you have for improving project handover? So um, keep them coming. You can send in more than one answer, and um, we will make sure that they're available to you. Um, I don't think we've really got time to look through them at the moment, but what you will um, be aware of is once you, I think you can put in your email address and download the results. So, uh, so again, keep those coming. Um, what we are, we do now uh, like to do on the benefit SIG is uh, have some reflective practice. So we want to know what you've learned from this webinar, um, and that could be uh, now while it's all fresh in your mind or uh, um, reflected a little later. So uh, thank you for that one. Um, what we're now going to do is switch to the uh, Q&A with Rebecca and Owen. I think there's been some questions coming in. So uh, Rebecca, uh, are you able to pick up on those? Sure, thanks Merv. Um, yeah, we have some questions for you, Owen. Uh, the first one from Tom. Have you found that failed handovers are more down to the PM not delivering the project properly or the client and user not fully understanding what they required? So uh, I suppose there's, there's two ways of answering that. One is my personal experience, uh, and, and one is what's come from the research. What's come from the research, um, there is much more evidence of it being an issue with um, client side, um, either not specking properly or not being clear as to the outputs. 
Um, in, in practice, from my experience, I would probably say it's a mix. Um, the, the, there's, there's, there's good and bad in all industries. I think if the, um, if the project doesn't deliver um, and there has been a clear set of criteria established at the beginning, the client is not to blame for that. Um, I, I've found it to be probably about a 50-50 in the sense that sometimes it's due to being uh, due to a lack of clarity up front. Um, sometimes it's about the project just not delivering, either because the project team hasn't delivered or because the, uh, the, the, the either cost or time or scope parameters haven't been established in a way that is actually deliverable. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks Owen. Um, second question from Lily. If an overlap of project managers is not possible, i.e. code handover of a project, what are the key steps to ensuring the handover is as successful as possible and not to the detriment of the project client? Well, if, if you're not able to maintain the people, then you have to maintain the knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it falls into the documentation and information management element of it. Um, if and yeah, I'm 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 well aware that sometimes people just get parachuted in and uh, people leave at short notice. I think that's why it's critical to have the thinking about how knowledge and data is captured up front and embedded within all the project processes, so that you're you're gathering that information as you go along, because then you'll have the lessons learned from each stage, you'll have the project history. You'll have all the key data, which will include some of your project management key documents, such as the program and the cost and all that kind of um, information that an incoming project manager would require. But you've also got a very clear brief up front with measurable benefits and the incremental build-up of knowledge along the way in a format that is meaningful. Okay. Um, we have another question here, um, this time from Barry. And he asks, um, he's interested in the section on understanding differing client types, which seems to be a key factor in ensuring smooth handovers. Do you know of any tools or methods available to be able to identify these client types, or is such an assessment more of an intuitive gut feel type of thing? I'm not personally aware of any specific tools beyond the sort of Myers-Briggs type thing. I mean, there's no, there's, no, there's no reason why you couldn't look at um, the client through that kind of, um, uh, I don't know the, the correct term for it, but that sort of um, analysis of personality types. Um, I, I think in some ways the client is, or, or in some instances, the client is often quite self-aware in terms of being clear on what their... Um, their sort of um, constraints are. Oftentimes your client may very well want to do things but is constrained by procurement or funding or regulative, regulative um, uh, sort of uh, uh, constraints. So um, as I say, I'm not, I'm not aware of a client specific element of it, but in your stakeholder analysis, the sort of Mendelow's matrix of um, informed versus um, sort of just uh, sort of critically engaged. Mm -hmm. um, you can you can you can conduct a client analysis in the same way that you would conduct a generic stakeholder analysis. Yeah. Um, that's a good yeah. Um, okay. Another question we have here from Daniel. Um, he says, "How important are soft skills in encouraging those with the authority to release the relevant end users for training and other handover activities, as opposed to setting a date and tough luck if they don't attend?" I, th I think it's really, really important, and I, I think that that approach to training is it's not just necessarily the soft skills of having to negotiate or persuade people to be there. Um, I think it's also having a discussion with, it, it, you, can, you can break it down to a review of risk effectively. The risk of whoever is operating the project output at the end of it being insufficiently prepared to do that is that you spent all this time and money to no avail or it becomes abortive or you end up having to spend additional time and money for repeat training. So I think that you can engage with both the um, sort of end user side of life but you can also engage with the project teams because 
they'll be keen to ensure that the training is done in a way that they receive sign-off. Um, and they'll be keen to ensure that they're properly imparting the knowledge as it moves across from phase to phase. So I, I would strongly suggest that that upskilling is brought much further forward because if you're at a um, couple of months out, there's a high probability that at key points, especially if it's a reasonable size project, some people that you would ideally want available might not be available at such relatively short notice. So the, 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 the more you can kind of front load that discussion around who needs training on what and start embedding that organizational change, because you may very well find that what that discussion flags up is that the client or the end user doesn't have the skills in-house to be able to manage what they're getting. One of the things that I saw frequently working on schools was that very rudimentary mechanical systems were replaced by very, very complicated digital systems, building management systems, which required a completely different skill set. And there was probably a discussion to be had much, much sooner that said, you actually need to employ someone or retrain someone to be able to manage what you're going to get. You're not going to be able to achieve that in a two-month period. Thanks, Owen. And um, we have another question here from David, who says, if you were making the project team available after the handover, how do you ever get away? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, again, it's all, it's all down to clear parameters and um, having a set point. And that, that's about agreeing, in the first instance, where handover is. Because what you might be talking about is not necessarily a period of cessation of activity, but what you might be talking about is a handover of responsibility. So if the project team or key members of that project team are there for a period of time afterwards, it could be with the capacity not to carry on doing it for someone, but training someone to do it as they start picking it up. So it's, it's not to kind of artificially prolong the management of something. It's to make sure that whoever is going to ultimately be operating it is sufficiently skilled and, more importantly, gets the experience while they've got someone in place. So it, it, it's almost like a mentoring type role. Mm. And uh, finally, we have a question from Liam. He says, in a commercial world, surely the client dictates the level of handover service. Should they not place greater onus on this element as it is in their best interest, opposed to the consultant, contractor, developer, or provider of the service? Uh, yes, is, 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 is the short answer. And I think that what you often find is um, where budget pressure is um, an issue, the client knows that they are not getting um, the perfect world, and therefore one of the elements that starts getting brought back and cut back is things like that extended aftercare period. But I think if there is an understanding that they know they're not going to get that, that needs to be established much, much earlier on because then at least you can start getting some of those end users involved in the project phase a little bit earlier to try and understand what they've got to deal with if you can't have the transition in the way that you would ideally like it. Mm, okay. All right. Well, I think that brings us close to the end of the, the, the webinar now. There are a couple of more questions, but we can answer those outside of the webinar and upload the answers to the community. Uh, web page. Um, I would just like to thank Owen very much on behalf of the Benefits Management SIG and thank you to everybody else who has attended this webinar. Thank you for your time. As mentioned at the start, the slides and recording will be made available on the YouTube channel and the APM Benefits Management SIG community group and we will get the unanswered questions out to you as well. So thank you to everybody for attending.